I, I supervised the high school lunchroom for 20 years. I'm an eternal optimist. I don't give up this easy. We can make a difference. We have to make a difference. This is an existential threat. The left has a problem. The problem is that we suck at arguing. More specifically, we suck at arguing about science. And that's why we're here to talk about climate change. For the purpose of this video, let's assume that most climate change deniers are conservatives. This seems like a relatively reasonable and harmless assumption, considering that the Republican candidates in recent midterms have been pretty consistently anti-climate. Not in favor of offshore drilling, mm -hmm. but I am in favor of more oil production, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, now, I believe fossil fuels are not evil. I believe we can burn fossil fuels and do it in a clean fashion. My position is that I want to have some common sense when it comes to environmental regulations. If you are going to suggest that we need to completely reorder our economy and create tremendous new costs for individuals based upon a climate change policy, then you're going to have to show me that it's actually going to work. Meanwhile, here are some candidates on the left talking about climate change. I'm Jared Polis, and I'm running for governor to achieve 100% renewable energy. We can make a difference. We have to make a difference. This is an existential threat. With that being said, the, the economic argument is, is totally flawed. The path to a stronger economy is for Minnesota to own the clean energy economy, to make sure we're leading and creating jobs. Solar power is now at parity. And I don't know the last time I saw a naval carrier battle group protecting southern Minnesota's wind turbines or biofuels the way they protect the oil fields off the coast of uh, Saudi Arabia or whatever it may be. You might have noticed that not only are the opinions themselves very different, the delivery style is radically at odds. Candidates like California's Republican John H. Cox tend to use simpler words and sentence structure, whereas candidates like Minnesota's Democratic Tim Walls tend to use more academic and by extension awkward phrasing. Walls reminds me a lot of Hillary Clinton's 2016 running mate Tim Kaine. He's not unlikable, but he's not likable. He's like when your uncle gets really mad about football during Thanksgiving and then won't stop talking about it for the rest of the day and then by the end it gets real weird. Walls comes off as preachy and essentially distant, whereas Cox comes off as a man with common sense someone you could have a beer with. I'm a bleeding heart Democrat down to the bone, and even I think Walls is kind of hard to listen to. So, what's the problem here? Well, it's the aesthetic. Aesthetic. Aesthetic, as it's normally used, brings up images of wavy grids on a purple background, fairy lights, um, fancy fonts, and weirdly specific stylistic names like Tokyo Future Noir, or um, Tokyo Futur Noir. My mistake. But aesthetics in a general sense is the way something is presented. When we talk about the aesthetics of an argument or of politics in general, we're talking about how you deliver your argument. Even if you have a great argument with all the facts on your side, if you deliver it poorly, it doesn't matter at all. And this isn't my idea. This goes way back. It's time to give your argument skills a makeover. Ancient Greek style. Aristotle is the main dude behind the concept of rhetoric. In other words, he wrote the rules for how to talk gooder. He very literally did write the book, and the book was entitled Rhetoric. But even though the art itself is ancient, we see it in modern use all the time. 
these days it mostly lies dormant waiting for someone to remember it, but its effects still linger in the way we talk. For the rest of this video, we'll be picking through some modern examples of rhetoric. But why does it matter? Why should you care? Well, in response, I'll redirect you to Willard R. Espy, rhetorical expert and wonderfully whimsical old man. If rhetoric were no more than an ornamental contrivance, it would still provide an intellectual and even sensual pleasure. But far from it being merely ornamental, the devices of rhetoric are useful tools. With their aid, it is possible to state with force and clarity. Yet with all the enhancement of resonance that figures of speech, sentence arrangement, and the rest of rhetoric can supply, what otherwise could be only lamely and partially expressed. Rhetoric can be divided into three basic styles with boring Greek names like Asiatic and Rhodian, but for the purposes of this video, we'll just stick with calling them fancy, medium, and plain. You can tell the styles apart by how and if they use figures. Figures are defined by Richard A. Lanham, another kindly old man, as any device or pattern of language in which meaning is enhanced or changed. The fancy style has lots of flowery language. My loathing is as deep as a Norwegian fjord and as harsh as a gale. I despise, detest, disdain this terrible, terrible foolishness of fools. The plain style uses only simple words and structure. I hate you. You're stupid. And the medium style is in between. You're driving me up the wall. Will you stop and think for five seconds? The fancy style and the medium style are actually pretty similar on the number of embellishments they use but the kind they use says a lot. In this example, the fancy style uses similes, alliteration, and repetition for emphasis, as well as a figure called oxesis, where a regular word is replaced with a more highfalutin one. In contrast, though the medium style does use ornamentation, metaphor, hyperbole, and epiplexis, which is a rhetorical question used as a put-down, they're a lot less pretentious. One of the figures used here, a funky one called hendiatus, is where instead of saying stop to think, you say things like stop and think. This is a figure everyone uses. It actually messes up the grammar a little bit, but it makes the phrasing more natural. In short, even though the medium style uses embellishments, a lot of the time they serve to bring out how commonplace the speech is without making it seem too condensed. I hate you, you're stupid is commonplace, but it's also stunted and gets boring really fast. Imagine if you listened to a speech that was like that the whole way through. It would be hard to take it seriously. And don't get me wrong, the plain style doesn't necessarily use less figures, it just uses a different kind. In I hate you, you're stupid, we can pick out brevitas, concise expression, categoria, insulting your opponent directly to their face, and anadiplosis, using the last word of the first sentence as the first word of the second sentence. Each style is appropriate for different occasions. The fancy style would be appropriate for a decorative speech, like a eulogy. It also shows up a lot in poetry. The plain style is how we normally talk in day-to-day -day life, and the medium style is for when you want to be persuasive. Good lawyers use the medium style. For decades, the most convincing politicians used the medium style. But there's been a turn in the tides. Donald J. Trump. Trump is often praised by his supporters as someone who tells it like it is. He's posed as a classic man of the people archetype. And what that really boils down to is the use of the plain style in his speeches. He talks the way a lot of people talk in day-to-day -day life, not necessarily in the actual content, but in the literal words he uses. Let's look at a clip of one of his speeches, a rally in South Carolina this June. Right from day one, when I came down here, Henry McMaster, I said, so why are you with me? He said, because I like what you're saying. I agree. We need strong borders. We're talking about it now, and we have. So, he said, we need strong borders, we have to stop crime, we want lower taxes, we love our military, we love our vets, and we love our Second Amendment. Other than that, I don't know what he said. Looking at this from the most basic level, we can see he's not using big words. The largest word in this paragraph is either military, by syllables, or amendment, by letters both of which are pretty well known. Out of a total of 63 words, 
53 are one syllable. That means 95% of the words here are less than three syllables. The word syllable is three syllables. Now, his vocabulary is very stripped down, but most of his sentences wander and loop because he's obviously winging it, and there is some appeal to that. It makes it seem more organic. Where traditional conservatives like John H. Cox are appealing but bland, Trump is explosive. He's entertaining to watch. John H. Cox starts his speech with 10 minutes of I'm a regular guy-ing, but Trump starts with shoutouts like a vlogger. A man named Henry McMaster. We're not gonna do that. It is great, it is great to be with you. Before we begin, let's all take a moment to send our love to Katie Arrington, who was badly hurt in a terrible car accident. He also uses some common rhetorical figures. And buckle down now, because we're about to be throwing around some Latin. It's time to put on the rhetoric hat. His speech is peppered with Perelkin. Superfluous words that seemingly improve the flow, etouffee with analogy, in this case referring to himself in third person, and steeped in a sententia, a short catchy saying, like, build the wall. He sets up a fictional dialogue between himself and McMaster that begins with a bastardization of his old adversary's campaign slogan, not I'm with her, but why are you with me? Keep in mind that this was this last June. 2018. Clinton is no longer politically relevant outside of the modern conservative rhetorical technique of using an irrelevant opponent to create an us versus them situation in which the audience is asked to pick a side. The right side. The bulk of the paragraph is given to an anabasis where the speaker builds up a point through a series of phrases with parallel structure. The emotional quality is in turns Cohortatio, amping up indignation. Ominatio, warning of impending doom or evil. And Bomphiologia, bombastic and triumphant, something characteristic of Trump throughout his career. He closes out with an apophysis, pretending to deny something while actually affirming it. This creates sort of a humble brag esque ending. I don't need to elaborate, I'm already impressive. The big patterns we see in his use of rhetoric are he disregards typical grammatical rules and conventions in order to focus on the raw effect, uses repeatable short claims that catch on easily, drives to a point, and lives and dies by strong and continuous emotional appeals, particularly forms of bragging. In contrast, let's play back that quote from earlier in the video. I, I supervised the high school lunchroom for 20 years. I'm an eternal optimist. I don't give up this easy. We can make a difference. We have to make a difference. This is an existential threat. With that being said, the, the economic argument is, is totally flawed. The path to a stronger economy is for Minnesota to own the clean energy economy, to make sure we're leading and creating jobs. Solar power is now at parity. And I don't know the last time I saw a naval carrier battle group protecting southern Minnesota's wind turbines or biofuels the way they protect the oil fields off the coast of uh, Saudi Arabia or whatever it may be. In an effort to avoid getting bogged down talking about Trump forever, I'll keep this one more succinct. Tim Walls uses relatively less common words like existential and parity. 95% of Trump's spit is under three syllables, while only 84% of Walls's is. While Trump's grammar varies and breaks to sound more casual American, Walls's is unwavering. His sentences are planned and succinct. It sort of gives the impression he practiced this bit a lot in the mirror this morning. Walls doesn't have anything particularly repeatable here, and he doesn't much drive to a point. Actually, he kind of anti-climaxes. It's off the coast of uh, Saudi Arabia or whatever it may be. Walls does have a general appeal to emotion built into the speech, but it's mostly cohortatio with a pinch of Paeonismus, the figure of optimism, at the beginning. And Trump comes across as a lot more relatable and persuasive to a lot of people. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells me that the way to be relatable is to tone it down. I'm not saying anyone is stupid or that you need to tone yourself down for the- But what I am saying is that you should try not to sound like you went to Yale and want everybody to know it. Second, build up to something exciting. As much as possible, Structure your speech in a series of small rhetorical ladders that end at highs, but above all, do not be pretentious. Do not look down on anyone, even if they can't spell. Up until now, we focused almost entirely on politicians. Now it's time to turn to a matter closer to home. 
random strangers on Reddit. The subreddit r slash climate change is a forum dedicated to talking about, but very clearly not debating about, climate change. In fact, the first rule of the subreddit is no politics. Your post will be silently deleted if it is about politics. I think this is a really interesting approach to climate change. As we've already seen, every politician has an opinion, and it's not exactly a bipartisan agreement. But despite the warning of no politics, there are frequently posts like this one. I'm a climate change denier. Change my mind. This tells us another important thing about climate communication. Don't frame it as politics. Frame it, as described in the pinned rules post, as a rational discussion. This has two benefits. First, it avoids prompting an immediate us-versus-them response along party lines as much as possible with the subject. And second, it's a phrase conservatives and centrists are given to using. As they say, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, it goes to his head. If you talk to a man in his language, it goes to his heart. Now, let's get back to those people who can't spell from the title card of this section. I'm a climate change denier. Change my mind. I don't believe in climate change. I always like getting getting the opposing opinion on something before I'm making up my mind. Please hit with that evidence so I may make an informed decision. Okay, there are a lot of mistakes there, <laughs> but it's pretty obvious that Alex West is open to changing his mind. This is not someone we want to drive away by being aggressive and condescending, but this is exactly what user Lost Shaker Assault does. Posts like this suck. Mods should get rid of them. Go research yourself if you are truly interested in the topic. If you have a specific piece of evidence you would like to discuss, great. Otherwise, this topic is broader than you think. Do some preliminary googling, at least, prior to asking the sub to do the work for you. This is abrasive, dismissive, and mean-spirited. It accomplishes nothing. If you were in Alex West's position and some dude was directly insulting you, it would suck, right? It might even turn you away from wanting to engage at all. In response to Lost Shaker Assault, Climate Changer brings up a great point. I don't mind entering questions, so I don't think it's so bad. Sometimes it's difficult to know where to look initially for information that isn't prohibitively scientific. Especially with a topic like climate change, which is both divisive and based in scientific papers with very confusing wording. Atmospheric gases trapped in polar ice at the fern to ice transition layer are enriched. The maximum enrichments observed. Oxygen-18 is trapped in CO2, CH4, and O2 in ice cores, which must be known in order to decipher ancient atmospheric isotopic ratios. Ugh. I can see how it would be difficult to figure out where to start. I would wager that most people who spend a lot of time thinking about climate change, myself included, got lucky with a good introduction. I know that I, for one, certainly did not go looking for the most confusing scientific papers possible straight out of the gate. And I never grew up in an anti-climate home, so I wasn't conditioned into believing it was a hoax. I do believe it is possible, and indeed necessary, for someone to change their mind even if they have been conditioned into thinking climate change is a hoax. But they can't do it alone. They need people to argue them down off the proverbial ledge. They do not need this. There was no question posed by OP. This post is also full of typos and reeks of a lack of effort. The awesome work in some of the responses here seem wasted on a lazy, closed mind who clearly reads BS and clings to its facts. Exponential Antarctic growth? And a very similar question will be posed again soon, as you will know if you frequent the sub. There are several regular skeptics here that sometimes dominate these types of posts, which then require additional effort to explain. I agree that a good question deserves an answer. However, an arrogant challenge to change the mind of someone like OP seems like a waste of time to me. Can we put together a sidebar to refer these posts to? The worst assertion here is that Alex West has a lazy, closed mind. Alex is obviously a very open-minded person. He says he wants to make an informed decision. But Law Shaker Assault can't look past the spelling mistakes. This is the fundamental boiled down problem we have to overcome if we want to change people's minds about climate change. We can't be that condescending and expect to inspire our audience. But there's more. Most of the other responses are pretty unhelpful. Ho-hygen? Hologen? Ho hygiene? Um, this guy says, Can you give a scientific-based argument for what has driven the global climate development for the last century without human contribution? If not, the only possible explanation is human contribution. Then Deckhand basically says, okay, but no. And then um, this guy is like, I agree that what else can it be is a bad argument. What I meant is in climate science, 
is the human GHG contribution well documented by physics. It's well known for more than a century that variations in CO2 severely contributes to climate change. Look up Savante Arhernius for a starting point. If you want to remove this well-documented piece of the jigsaw puzzle that is the science of climate change, is a physical theory that fulfill this gap between observations and the known physics of natural causes to climate change necessary. If you cannot find this physical explanation, is the explanation with human influence more likely? Most of that... Most of that didn't even make sense. But there's still more. Possibly the worst one is this one. Do you understand the greenhouse effect? It's really very simple. CO2 is see-through for visible light, but there are different colors, or spectra. In the infrared spectrum of 12 to 15 micrometers, it absorbs the outgoing heat radiation that radiates. Why? Why did you think that would help? In what world is that a good starting point? So, how should we respond? How do we talk gooder? Let's go through the best response I found on Alex West's original post. This one is a pretty long one, so bear with me. Janukeo says, First of all, I appreciate your instinct to listen to the opposing opinion before making up your mind. I think that you're probably better off getting a widely used textbook about climate science, e.g. Global Physical Climatology by Dennis Hartman, rather than asking Reddit, but I can give you my opinion. My personal feeling re climate change denial is that it's tantamount to visiting your doctor who says, hey, I think you have lung cancer, and then you being like, nah, I'm gonna listen to a real medical expert, i.e. the cigarette company who says smoking has nothing to do with cancer. But in all seriousness, I really do not understand the mindset of having experts, i.e. 98% of climate scientists give you their informed evidence-based opinion but choosing not to believe them on the grounds that spokespeople from oil and gas and coal companies claim otherwise. I think that you need to be very careful in assessing the motives of the people who give you information. Clearly, someone who's associated with Shell is not going to be motivated to tell you the truth about climate change, just like tobacco companies waited for decades to concede that smoking causes cancer. With that rant out of the way, here are some sources where you can find more information about climate change. Links, including NASA's page. You can also just Google to find news articles about how climate change is already affecting specific regions. I think that in order to deny climate change, you have to believe that a really monumental amount of peer-reviewed, peer-replicated scientific evidence is made up. I guess I can't convince you that thermometers work and satellites work and so on. All I can say is this. If you really are so skeptical of the state of modern day science, I'm really surprised that you haven't boycotted TV, internet, cell phones, cars, and modern medicine while you're at it. So, what's good about this? Well, the start is great. Starting with a compliment is a strong opening. If you open with kindness, it makes your audience much more receptive to criticism. Then they refer their audience to a good source to look into later. The important thing is that this isn't, hey, you're stupid, go read a book. It's, hey, there's this cool thing I think you should check out. It's a suggestion, not a command from on high. Using an analogy is also a good way to boil down your ideas so that they come across better, particularly for someone who's a little out of their depth. Providing links, also a good idea, makes everything as easy as possible saying climate change instead of global warming. This is very small, but it's good because it automatically avoids the classic, but it's been so cold this winter, denial argument. Similarly, using the phrase climate change denial instead of something more euphemistic like climate skepticism. It's just better framing. The personal address phrases are also a nice touch. Speaking one-on-one -on -one with your audience is a great way to endear yourself, but there are a couple of unfortunate mistakes here. The major one is in this point about claims made by spokespeople from oil and gas and coal companies. This is a good thing to bring up, but it's structured badly. I think this probably comes from Jan Ukeo, assuming that Alex West has heard something like this argument before, but based on the tone of his original post, I don't think so. I would go ahead and assume total ignorance here, and I'm not saying that as an insult, just an observation. This point would be better if it was prefaced by an explanation. The end is also dismissive. Here we are again, at the big problem. Our own damn pretentious attitudes. I guess I can't convince you that thermometers work and satellites work and so on. All I can say is this. If you really are so skeptical of the state of modern day science, I'm really surprised that you haven't boycotted TV, internet, cell phones, cars, and modern medicine while you're at it. Yeesh, just drop this altogether. I'm sure it was fun to write a scathing outro, but I don't know anyone who would be affected by this kind of a call to action. How do we end it then? Well, how does our master rhetorician, turner of tides, breaker of conventions, end sections? With apophysis, move on quietly and calmly. And it would be great here to cut up the ending paragraph a little bit. 
after, I think that in order to deny climate change, you have to really believe that a monumental amount of peer-reviewed, peer-replicated scientific evidence is made up. Closing with a nice, those are my thoughts on the subject. Have a nice day. Would be appropriate. Intro with a compliment. Outro with well wishes. So I just want to come back to a theme here that we've brushed around a couple times, but never directly addressed. Climate change is big and sad and scary. At least every documentary on the subject I've ever seen made it really seem like that. And it is, at least. It is intense and world-changing. But we don't always have to talk about it in those terms. When confronted with big, sad, scary things, I know I for one have a tendency to try and ignore them, to imagine them out of existence. But inspiring messages of hope and grassroots you can make a change politics always pull pretty hard on my heartstrings. So, as we're trying to recruit centrists and conservatives, etc., I just don't see how scare tactics are an effective incentive. And for those of us very far out on the left side, it tends to get easy to start to think, well, nothing other than a complete withdrawal from capitalism will absolve our complacent bourgeoisie sins. Ah, uh, Derek Jensen, what a man. Perceiving simple living as a political act accepts capitalism's redefinition of us from citizens to consumers. Acting decisively to stop the industrial economy is very scary for a number of reasons, included but not restricted to the fact that we lose some of the luxuries, like electricity, to which we've grown accustomed, and the fact that those in power might try to kill us if we very seriously impede their ability to exploit the world, none of which alters the fact that it's a better option than a dead planet. Any option is a better option than a dead planet. Yeah, I mean, I might agree with you on a theoretical level, but on a practical and rhetorical level especially, not so much. This stance sets up a black and white landscape of terror and looming Armageddon. Give up electricity or the planet dies, them's the brakes. If someone's on the fence about climate change, this isn't gonna help our cause. And here, unfortunately, is something we can learn from fascists. Now look, I know, I know, fascists are unsavory company, to say the least. But if there's one good thing you can say about them, it's that they're masters of rhetoric. In fact, the association has become so strong that you hear it all the time. So, fascist rhetoric. There's a major strategy they've been using for ages that's particularly well encapsulated by this one 4chan post. I originally found this through a ContraPoints video, so if you're interested in this kind of thing or want to get more educated about it, go check out her video. It's called Decrypting the Alt-Right, How to Recognize a Fascist, and it's very good. So, back to the post at hand. Fixing the Alt-Right. Don't get trapped in an echo chamber where you can no longer relate to normies. Disavow all Nazi slash KKK edgelord LARPers. There is no way to lose public support quicker than going around and making Nazi salutes and holding uh, tiki torches while chanting, Jews will not replace us. This instantly makes the average person hate you. Build a populist movement with realistic incremental overt goals. Repealing the 1965 Immigration Act and replacing it with something that both limits total immigration and prioritizes white immigration is an actual tangible political goal. Keep the long-term goals covert and don't ever reveal your power level. Talking openly about a white ethno state only leads to failure and the average public turning against you, so disavow anyone who reveals his power level. Leftist will recognize dog whistles and know we're crypto, but normies won't listen to them. Start first by focusing on multiculturalism, because it's a lot easier for people to see how non-white countries produce culture that is at odds with our values. People like Peter Thiel should be the voice of the alt-right, not cringe lords like Richard Spencer. As horrifying as this is on a larger scale, and it is really disturbing when you think about how it's an agenda for racists, it is an undeniably good game plan. And, as Queen Contra herself once said, it actually displays a sense of realistic pragmatism and an incremental approach to long-term goals that I wish were more common on the left. And there are three bits here I really wish the left would get our collective heads around. Disavow LARPers, which in our case means Derek Jensen types who talk about giving up electricity and becoming anarcho-primitivists. It's weird and ridiculous and let's try to look less like that. 
It's similar to how feminists have to avoid that image of a hysterically screaming woman with dyed hair. Keep long-term goals overt. If you, yourself, are a Derek Jensen type, bottle it. For the good of the cause, bottle it. Right now, the push cannot be huge, sweeping legislation. It has to be small legal protections. Better water regulations at a state level, preservation of public lands, etc. And on an individual level, the push has to be convincing everyone, absolutely everyone we can, that climate change is real, and we can do something about it. If you're interested in this kind of thing, or you think you might be, you should check out climate communication. It's an emerging and increasingly relevant field. I really only scratched the surface of it. I'll leave some links in the description to all of the references and resources that I used if you want to check those out. And now, I will leave you. But first, some really good quotes I came across while filming this video. Well, you know, I said the other day, and I didn't mean it to be too controversial, but it was, you, know, you, you sometimes have to, you know, say things that are, that are important. How do you make it affordable? You get rid of the layers and layers of regulation and you get rid of the assault of the trial lawyers and the environmentalists. People want the swamp drained. Uh, my uh, comparison is the clean out the barn in Sacramento. I drive a Tesla, I want the air clean. And I say to myself, wow, I mean, how many birds can exist here? They're tired of the rhetoric.